What do you guys think of when you think of a scientist? Is it this? Or this? Or maybe it's something more like this. OK, probably not that one. But the truth is, as much as STEM careers are pushed and encouraged nowadays, there is a serious disconnect between future STEM majors and the people who are actually working in these fields. I mean, engineers aren't all just a bunch of blokes in hard hats standing on a cliff pointing out into the distance. As lucky as I am to go to a school that exposes me to these career options as early as possible, we can't possibly cover everything. And we can't start addressing the big questions without first gaining some rudimentary knowledge. That's why today I've decided to talk to you about some of the big questions in biomedical engineering without any rudimentary knowledge. So here I go. Here we are looking at this slide and thinking, I know what these words mean separately. <laughs> but what do they mean together? <laughs> so don't worry, I won't completely skip out on the rudimentary knowledge part. Here's a very disgusting and textbooky looking picture of our cell's membrane. Here I go explaining it. On the top over there in blue, you see the outside of the cell. And on the bottom here in orange, you see the inside of the cell. Starting at the bottom of the picture, you'll see these orange fragments. They're called microfilaments. And they make up the internal skeleton of our cell and hold all of our cell organelles into place. Examples of organelles would include the nucleus and the mitochondria. If you follow these up to the membrane, you'll see they are connected to proteins, which in turn are connected to this fibrous material known as the extracellular matrix. What it boils down to is that there is a physical indirect path between the organelles of our cell and the outside of our cell. This is important because it allows cell-to-cell -cell communication between cells which are in close proximity to one another without a convoluted and energy inefficient method such as hormone transport. However, this system can also be taken advantage of for new biomedical research. Research has shown that vibrations can be detected by these fibrous materials in the extracellular matrix and follow the chain of command in this diagram all the way down to the cell's nucleus, where we hold our DNA. There, these vibrations can be interpreted and be used to cer turn certain genes on or off. But what does that even tell us? Before we answer that question, Let's take a moment to talk about stem cells. Stem cells are unspecialized cells that exist in our body. They can either replicate and form more stem cells, as in the top of this diagram, or they can specialize to become any of the over 200 different types of cell in our body. They specialize by reacting to environmental stimuli, which tells them which genes to code for to turn on or off in order to become a specific cell. So here's what we know. We know that vibrations can be detected outside of the cell and be used to turn certain genes on or off. We also know that stem cells specialize in response to environmental conditions which tell them which genes to turn on or off. Therefore, theoretically, it can be derived that finely tuned vibrations that occur outside of the cell may be used to deliberately specialize stem cells. Now, these stem cells can be used for a, variety of different reason, for a variety of different applications, the most common of which nowadays is regenerative tissues. So if an organ is damaged, we can regenerate the part of the organ is that is damaged. Ambitious research has shown that we might even be able to replicate entire organs from scratch. Other applications include treating degenerative cardiovascular and neurological conditions, such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Now, stem cell research is a buzzword that gets thrown around a lot nowadays, but it can sound a little bit gimmicky, especially when the implications of such re research are so often unexplored. Rest assured, there are actually great achievements happening in this field. Another such achievement refers to the inquiry of, oh, you always think it'll never happen to you. <laughs> Another such achievement refers to the inquiry of what are called cancer stem cells, or CSCs. Now, I should clarify, cancer stem cells are not the same as the stem cells I just mentioned. They are simply cancer cells which behave in a similar manner to stem cells. OK, going on. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to treat cancer is because one single cancer cell can spawn a variety, variety of different cancer cells, any of which can mutate to resist current treatment. An example of such a cancer is glioblastoma multiform, which is an aggressive brain tumor. 
Glioblastoma can have up to six variants of these subclones or different cancer species in a single patient. Any one of these, any one of these subclones could somehow resist the current treatment or spread to an area where it is no longer manageable or worth the risk to treat. So how is the biomedical community responding to this issue? New targeted treatment aims to seek out the origin CSC and target that single cell. Without that cell's presence, the rest of the tumor will not be able to survive and will naturally degenerate. And while previous treatment may have been able to remove the majority of a tumor, if the cancer stem cell gets left behind, the tumor can regenerate and form new subclones. For, an organ, for a cancer in an organ as vulnerable as the brain, this is huge news. Radiotherapy and chemotherapy can often have adverse effects on the brain. An operation is strictly limited by which area of the brain the cancer is localized to. Well, that's pretty scary, right? Your body is made up of over 30 trillion cells, yet somehow one single cell in a yellow circle can wreak havoc over your entire body and turn your life upside down. So, moving on. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right. Oh my God, this is so scary. <laughs> okay, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a different type of cancer which affects your blood cells. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to combat cancer is because the cancer cell receptors are so similar to the receptors on your normal body cells because they are derived from your own DNA. CAR T cell therapy is a new form of targeted therapy which aims to imp improve upon your immune cells and make them recognize the receptors on cancer cells. T cell, T -cell samples are taken from the patient and then the DNA from the T cells is reprogrammed to code for new protein receptors which are able to recognize the receptors on cancer cells. And as simple as, may, as that may sound, your DNA can only code for 20 different amino acids. And while these amino acids are able to combine and orient themselves to form millions of different proteins, there is, only, there is still no guarantee that the exact shape can be exactly and precisely matched by the proteins coded for by our own DNA. The only way to guarantee the production of a receptor that matches the protein receptor on a cancer cell is by bioengineering new amino acids and increasing the amount of proteins that we can make. Our alphabet has 26 letters. With these 26 letters, we were able to create the 2,000-page Oxford Dictionary. And while, while the dictionary is incredibly long and complex, there are still some sounds and words that will never exist in English despite being able to exist in other languages. The only way to guarantee the existence of such words is by adding new letters to the alphabet. The amino acid alphabet has 20 letters. Scientists have added 300 letters to the alphabet. They simulate these new amino acids on supercomputers, and then they use DNA printers to print them out. This new DNA is then incorporated back into the host cells and translated into new proteins which are able to recognize the receptors on cancer cells. Thanks to CAR-T cell therapy, five-year survival rates for acute lymphoblastic leukemia have gone up drastically, and nearly all patients for similar blood cancers go into remission. It was this drive to discover how to save large swaths of lives that initially drew me towards biomedical engineering. At the end of the day, though, it's not the answers to these questions that matter. It's the questions that we ask next. It's why we ask them. I present these examples to you not as an expert on the subject, but simply as someone who can't wait to see what we discover next. It's that spirit of inquiry that we should all embody about science. It's the passion to learn about new science and technology and discover how to better humanity. Because at the end of the day, when we like my science education won't end when I get a five on the AP exam or an A in my classes. It'll end when we run out of questions. So keep asking questions, because the more questions we ask and the more we wonder, the more we realize how much we have left to learn. All that and that this is definitely not science.